Hello, you beautiful individuals. Today, we are back with the reaction, commentary type, whatever thing to the documentary The Weakness of Kent Hovind by McKinnon Mitchell. It is a fantastic documentary of, I mean, extremely well put together. This is part three, so there are, are two other parts to me doing this. But really, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend just going and watching the documentary. It's amazing. I'm only doing this, honestly, because somebody asked me to. And I also really, really enjoyed it, and I wanted to be out there. It's just, it it shows the sleazeball and just lying con artist that Kent Hoven is, but without going into the whole Young Earth and all that nonsense. Like, it purely focuses on the character of the man and the horrid things he has done to countless people, and still does to this day. But anyways, last time we left off at about 2708, I think, uh, around here. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's jump back into it. On July 11th, 2006, Hoven was indicted on 58 counts in the district court in northern Florida in Pensacola. The first 12 counts were charges for willful failure to collect, account for, and pay over federal income taxes and FICA taxes in connection with the CSC operation, totaling $473,818 for the 12 fiscal quarters of 2001 to 2003. The next 45 counts were charges for knowingly structuring transactions by making multiple cash withdrawals, totaling $430,500, in amounts just under $10,000, which requires reporting, a technique known as structuring, which his wife was also charged. The last count was a charge of corruptly endeavoring to obstruct and impede the administration of the internal revenue laws by falsely listing the IRS as his only creditor when filing for bankruptcy including filing a false and frivolous lawsuit against the IRS in which he demanded damages for criminal trespass, and was also charged for making threats of harm to those investigating him and to those who might consider cooperating with the investigation, as well as destroying records. Kent has made the claim multiple times that a SWAT team burst into his home to arrest him. I was sitting, at, uh, I was sitting in my office in Pensacola. Now, this example coming up, it... It just shows perfectly, even if he's not fully lying about something, he has to exaggerate it or misrepresent it in a way to make it seem not only way worse than it is, but then he just, he does it so much that it turns into a lie. Like, so yes, people came in, as far as I understand it, it was uh, IRS agents mostly, and obviously I'm sure some law enforcement, um, and basically, you know, did their thing, arrested him, went through the house and collected evidence, and he claims it was a SWAT team, apparently, but there's no record of it, which, you know, he'll, they'll get into that here in a second, but it's just, the dude just has to lie about absolutely everything. In my house, uh, getting ready for Bible study with the staff that morning, and the police officers and SWAT team came in, I said, what's the matter? They said, you're under arrest. I said, for what? For structuring. But no record of a SWAT team or a team of similar nature has ever been found. From the testimony of IRS Special Agent Scott Schneider, a search warrant was granted to search the premises of Kent Hovind's home, where Kent was present. He and the other agents did not burst into the home and actually granted Kent Hovind quite a bit of freedom to roam about the house with them, which Agent Snyder explains the reason. We allowed him a little bit more freedom in the spirit of cooperation. We allowed him, as we made our first contact and entry into the residence where we suspected guns to be present, to walk back with us and attempt to call out the individuals that were still inside. That's not something I would have normally done, but in this case, we erred on the side of trying to minimize the accusations that could be leveled at a later date. He further explains that the individuals who were present on the premises were identified, questioned, and whether or not they agreed to answer, they were free to go while they executed the search warrant. Not even Kent's lawyer attempts to even hint at excessive force being used because no such SWAT team was ever involved. Although lying is not beyond Kent Hoven, as Agent Snyder soon found out. The agents executing the search warrant were not without their suspicions of Kent Hoven's potential for violence. Hoven made a series of veiled threats against the IRS agents, being quoted by saying the following. 
God knows how to deal with people who challenge his ministry. During a radio broadcast while discussing the case, Kent made reference to Psalm 5515 in regards to the IRS. Psalm 5515 reads, Let death seize upon them, and let them go down quickly into hell, for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. Let death seize upon them. But it was not words alone that made the IRS agents cautious when dealing with Kent Hovind. They had been informed of a rumor that Kent was armed, but when asked about weapons on the property, Kent lied about the locations of the guns throughout the house. In the search, they found a Tech-9 pistol. Which, I mean, you know, and maybe, maybe if I have to give him some benefit of the doubt, maybe he just didn't remember the ex exactly where they were. But honestly, why lie about that? Like, they're going to search your house. Just tell, them where, well, just tell them where it is at that point. I mean, you're already... It's just so dumb. Why are you making it worse? Yeah, I don't know. Honestly, he probably just thought he was smart enough to had him hidden enough well that, you know, they would have never found him. He's just a... Ah, this dude. An SKS rifle and numerous other pistols, some of which were loaded. Despite being afforded the freedom to roam about within reason, Kent immediately abused this freedom by instructing one of his workers, Dan Wood, to not comply with the orders given by the IRS agent, which led to Dan Woods physically pushing past an agent and refusing to leave the premises, leading to his detainment. There was no SWAT team, and the only hostility came from Kent Hovind. But this would pale in comparison to Kent's hostility in his later years. The trial began on October 21st, 2006, a lawyer who worked for a nonprofit Christian organization testified that Hovind claimed to have beat the tax system and that he favored cash transactions because they were untraceable and consequently non-taxable, all of which mimics Glenn Stoll's previously mentioned modus operandi. That lawyer's name is David Charles Gibbs III. I have spoken with Mr. Gibbs' law office to invite them for an interview. They declined, but did afford me the liberty to tell you as to why. Simply put, they are concerned about the potential backlash that they could receive from, as they described, some of Kent Hovind's psychotic followers, which is an entirely understandable reason to avoid bringing details back into the spotlight. Though I do want to clarify that they in no way suggested all of Kent Hovind's followers are psychotic, but behavior from some of Kent's following justifies this response, which will be validated later. In the trial, David Charles Gibbs was called as a witness as he had spoken with Kent at his home in the past. Mr. Gibbs testified, There was a great deal of what I would call bravado in his claim that he had this reviewed in the past and he had won. He said every attorney that he had look at it claimed that he was right. And I said, You're telling me a lawyer in the state of Florida signed his name to that, that you don't have to pay taxes and you don't have to withhold taxes. And Kent said, well, it wasn't in Florida. And I said, well, where is this lawyer? I mean, I'd like to see that. He said, a guy out west. And then I said, well, is he a lawyer? Michelle Heldmeyer then asked, did you ever come to learn who that person was that Mr. Hoven was talking about? To which Mr. Gibbs said, it was a gentleman. I had never met him personally. I did talk to him on the phone one time. A gentleman by the name of Glenn Stoll. Glenn Stoll the known tax fraud who is now pleading guilty to conspiracy to defraud the United States. Many See, and right there I think is a good example of what is just wrong with Hoven. I mean, there's many, many things. But he, he, just, he latches on to these people with these outlandish ideas and sometimes dangerous ideas and then just sticks with them and will not change his mind. He has the, no ability to admit he was wrong. Uh, he's just, uh, to say he's self-deluded or narcissistic is just, would be the greatest understatement of existence. Many claims have been made by Kent Hovind about the trial. Here are a few. And so when the U.S. attorney who went and seized the church property, John David Roy Acheson, and Hel Miss Heldemeyer, whose husband was involved in pedophilia, when he went to Detroit to have sex with a five-year-old, he seized all the church property, seized the bank account, a couple weeks later, he flew to Detroit to have sex with a five-year-old, got arrested, and hung himself in jail. That's the guy who put me in jail, John David Roy Atchison, on the team that went after me. The government broke a hundred laws to throw me in prison to shut me up. At sentencing, the judge said, Mr. Hovind, your crime is worse than rape. 
So all three of those things. Now, for one, the the attorney that you talked about in the beginning. Yeah, that guy's disgusting. I mean, P.O. piece of shit. Like, freaking throw him in jail for life. Kill him for all I care. Disgusting. No, no excuse. The only thing is, he really wasn't on the case. And the whole, you know, the judge or whatever saying it's worse than rape, no. That didn't happen at all. It'll go over that, of course, here in the documentary, but just basically, <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing because it turned out to be his own son that said that, and that was the only person that said that. Unless you, you know, believe Hoven's crazy idea or lie of they changed the transcripts, but no, it's just, as you'll see, it's ridiculous, and yeah, he's just lying and lying and using emotion to try to defend himself, like, with things like with the attorney. I mean, what that attorney did is horrendous and despicable, but again, the attorney wasn't actually on the case. He didn't throw him in jail. He had, like, one very, very minute part of the case, um, but anyway, he'll, it'll explain that here. Painstaking of a process as it was, I examined all of the court transcripts for the entirety of the trial. No evidence of these claims can be found anywhere throughout the transcript, nor anywhere else in my research. Yet, Kent has a very convenient excuse for that. My attorney kept saying, hey, where's the transcript? Where's the transcript? Well, we're still working on it, we're working on it. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. They were changing it. How do they, you know? They, oh, there's changes yeah. in the transcript. Which is ironic, because earlier in the same interview, Kent Hovind relies on the transcript in an attempt to validate his position. If you find out Kent Hovind took out less than 10000 you must find him guilty. Which is not the law. How do you know he did this? They read it in court. It's in the transcript. It's part of the trial. The same transcript that he himself... And I don't know if I mentioned it, but again, it's, it's the fact that you were doing that to avoid reporting it, to avoid paying taxes. This is about taxes. The reason you didn't do anything more than ten grand is because they would have reported it, so, and you would have had like I just he just he just, uh, he just doesn't comprehend anything. But I, I don't know why I'm ever surprised. Himself has suggested is edited and faulty. Now, unfortunately, I cannot realistically read through the entire transcripts on screen for the purpose of the documentary. It's hundreds of pages. However, digital copies are available online to be downloaded readily. On the other hand, there are a few key notes worth sharing in regards to the trial. Kent has enjoyed claiming that an attorney named John David Roy Atchison was one of the prosecutors in his case. The reality is that it was Michelle Heldmeyer who was the prosecutor that put Kent in prison. Atchison was involved in one single moment of the case and that was filing a motion after sentencing had already taken place. Said motion was also withdrawn for being a duplicate of a file that another attorney had already submitted. That's it. That's all Atchison did, and what he did was replaced, yet Kent acts as if Atchison was in the courtroom, working the case, and had a hand in putting him in prison. Why? Why fabricate this narrative? Because, for Kent's agenda of characterizing the court and the government as evil, John David Roy Atchison suits his agenda. Arrested yesterday at Metro Airport upon arrival from Florida, made his first appearance in Detroit federal court today. According to a deposition from the FBI special agent in charge of the investigation, Atchison told the undercover detective to tell her daughter that, quote, you found her a sweet boyfriend who will bring her presents. Atchison was charged with enticement of a minor. Disgusting. Like I said, definitely not defending that piece of shit. To engage in sexual activity aggravated sexual abuse, and traveling across state lines to have sex with someone under the age of 12. Let me be clear, Atchison is scum, and you'll never find me saying otherwise. My stating of the fact that Atchison had no involvement in the case is in no way a means of painting him in a better light or anything of that nature. The simple fact is that Atchison is useful for Kent's narrative, and it's why he wants to pull focus to that lie. Another claim that, in recent years, Kent has mentioned less and less is that Judge Casey Rogers made the claim that Kent's crimes were worse than rape. Yet, after reading through the entirety of the transcripts, no such quote can be found to which Kent will rely on his convenient excuse that the transcript has been doctored. 
Now, that's not to say that something similar hadn't been said, because the truth is, there was. But it comes from Eric Hovind, Kent's son. Addressing the court, Eric Hovind said the following. I'm looking into your face and I realize that you gave my dad 10 years in prison, and that's okay. I realize that this court considered my dad and what he did worse than a rapist, and that's okay. I also understand that the heart of the king, as Daniel Force says, is in God's hand. If the heart of the king is in God's hand, then I can assure you the heart of the judges and the heart of everybody else in here is in God's hand, and God's will is going to be done. And and right there, I mean, and I mean, he is the only one that said anything about rape. And, and again, I'm not saying, you know, evading your taxes and stuff is worse than rape. That's crazy. It's obviously about the amount of charges he had and all that. And that, that's I don't know. I'm not trying to get into the whole legal system and the law and how they punish people. I, I have my own, definitely have my own opinions on that nonsense. But regardless. It's just another example of Hoven just trying to use anything he can, to, just to prey on emotion to make himself look better, when in reality, he is just a piece of shit. Um, so I just pulled out the quote from the transcript here, where the judge says, I received letters from many of you, and at this point she's speaking to everyone who's in the, just the audience, just the people who came to observe. Like, okay. I received letters from many of you expressing the view that sometimes those convicted of heinous crimes are subject to less time than Mr. Hovind is facing in this case. This is a serious case, serious charges, serious conduct. Make no mistake about it. By your conduct in this case, Mr. Hovind, in my opinion, you dishonored the men and the women in our military, you dishonored your fellow Americans, and you've dishonored the Constitution of the United States. And that is the only thing that she said um, regarding this particular section about a heinous, a heinous crime. And um, so um, that was in regard to Kent Hovind's sentencing. And Eric that day had stood up and was a character witness for his father. And then the next day was Joe's sentencing, and Eric again stood up as a character witness for his mother. And um, um, when he stood up for Joe Hoving, his fa his father, I mean, sorry, his mother, he said um, that he reminded the judge that it had been his honor to speak on his father's behalf at his trial, but had he considered this occasion to speak on behalf of his mother to be ten times that honor. Justice has to be blind, Eric stated, as he agreed with the judge sentencing his father to a sentence worse than that of a rapist. He said that this whole trial was really meant for Kent to be made the example of and that Joe didn't need to be used in that same way. So Kent was the only one who ever used the word rapist. And he... Sorry, you mean Eric? I'm sorry, Eric was the only one who ever used the word rapist. The judge did not. Eric made that statement not Judge Casey Rogers. What a shock. Just another lie. And I unfortunately need to cut this video a little short. I try to go around the half hour mark, but this one will actually be even shorter than that, which, I mean, it's not a bad thing. It's just, you know, I am trying to make it through this, but fortunately, just have some stuff I need to do today. But I think this is a good stopping point. We can spend the next part really getting into the structuring, which is something that Kent clearly misunderstands what that actually is. Not saying I'm an expert, as I said, not an expert in anything. I'm an idiot. But even I understand a little bit about this and way more than Mr. Definitely Not a Doctor, Kent Hovind. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And until next time.